A very warm welcome to you today for the Why Do Business with New York session, which we're really, really excited about. Um, what, um, just from, from a, a housekeeping point of view, um, we're obviously recording this session this afternoon. It's, um, it's purely for internal purposes only. I can see that you're all on mute, and if you can stay on mute unless you're asking questions. If you have questions, please put them either in the chat or the Q&A function, and we've got time for questions at the end as well. Uh, we've got a terrific lineup for you uh, today. We're really excited. We've got some fab fabulous speakers on some really uh, hot topics, and we're, we're looking forward to hearing from all the speakers today. So why are we hosting this afternoon's session? Well, broadly, it's because we have a partnership uh, with the city of New York through the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce and various other partners in New York. And today's session is designed to create an awareness of our virtual trade mission, which is taking place on the 23rd and 24th of March, 2021. And today will give us a general overview of the New York market. We're very much focusing on two key uh, sectors for this mission, this virtual mission. We're focusing on sustainable fashion, um, and we're delighted that we have speakers on that today, including Mark and Michelle, uh, and FinTech as well. Uh, but I'm not going to say too much about that just now, because we'll come to that in due course. Um, I'm delighted that in the past we've had missions to New York, and I, I had the pleasure of visiting the city in 2016 and 2018. And as I say, we have a terrific relationship with the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce and the St. Andrews Society of New York State. And I think it's probably important to say that it's not just the city of New York, but the whole state of New York, and indeed as a gateway really to the Eastern Seaboard. And I know Ian's calling in from Washington, DC, and we've got callers from Boston today as well, including Bob. So it, it really is a kind of greater New York approach that we're taking. Um, I'd like to say up front, a thank you to all our speakers for joining us today, and we're delighted they're taking part so close to Christmas. And thank you to all of you for attending as well. And as I said, we will have a Q&A at the end. So our running order is very straightforward today. We're, we've got five excellent speakers. We're going to hear from Daniel Clark. Uh, Daniel is the Director of Business Development from the New York City Economic Development Corporation. Thank you for taking part, Daniel. Then we're going to hand over uh, and we're going to hear from Bob Fogarty, who's Vice President of the Americas for Technology for SDI, Scottish Development International. Um, we're then going to hear from Michelle Gabriel, who's a professor of sustainable fashion strategy at Glasgow Caledonian New York College. Then we're going to hear from Mark Hogarth, who we know well. Mark's the creative director of Harris Tweed. And then we're going to get an industry case study from Graham Dobbin, the chief executive uh, and international management and change consultant at Ascentif in New York as well. And then finally, um, we're going to get a, a, a roundup of the plans for March from my colleague, Seren Porteous. So really looking forward to hearing the contributions of all the speakers and having a good Q&A. And as I say, this is part of a, a programme of international trade partnership that Glasgow Chamber of Commerce has with Scottish Government and with Scottish Chambers of Commerce. And there's an, an extensive programme that we're pulling together for 2021 uh, including uh, mission, virtual missions to Shanghai, to Milan, to Germany. But as I say, we're super excited about the, all the possibilities of the mission to New York in March. And with that, I will now hand over to Daniel Clark. Um, and Daniel is going to talk up to us um, from the New York City Economic Development um, Corporation and is going to outline some of the key sectors and general market overview in New York. So Daniel, over to you. I don't know if Daniel's on mute. Sorry about that, trying to do two things at once. Good morning, good afternoon. I'm just going to throw up my deck here. I always like to check before I start. Can, uh, can I get a signal if everyone can see? Perfect. Thank you. Well, great. Um, really excited to, to be talking to you all uh, as we plan, plan your virtual visit in March. Um, 
I like to start with sort of giving you a, a broad overview of, of New York City, uh, our economy, uh, where we are today, uh, a bit of an abbreviated version, and then hopefully in March we could, we could dive in a little further. But uh, my name is, is Daniel Clark. I'm the Director of Business Development at the New York City Economic Development Corporation. In this presentation, uh, New York City, a global innovation hub, I'm going to walk you through the New York City value proposition as it applies to companies that are looking to expand to New York City. So I'll do that. I'll give you a little bit of an overview of our tech economy. And finally, I'll discuss some of the specific ways our team at EDC can help uh, your companies uh, find success in the city. So first I'd like to share with you just a little bit about my organization. NYC EDC is a mission-driven nonprofit org that creates shared prosperity across New York City. In this role, we take on everything from developing city-owned real estate assets. So we do this by guiding the transformation of underutilized properties into projects that support the creation of quality jobs and promote livable and affordable communities throughout the city. And we have about 66 million square feet under management. So equivalent to over 6 million square meters on the metro. We invest in growing industries like tech, cybersecurity, advanced manufacturing, and life sciences. And we also help companies like yours set up operations in, in New York so that you can continue to grow. Unlike other economic development orgs, we're involved in every stage of the process. Um, so we're, we're big picture thinkers as well. Um, and our jobs are to envision how the city should look in 10, 20, 30 years from now. This, of course, uh, includes bringing foreign investment to the five boroughs. And the five boroughs for a reference include Manhattan, the Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn, my hometown, Staten Island. Uh, so, so in summary, EDC creates the spaces and facilities that are needed uh, to thrive and, and to create jobs. We give, we give New Yorkers the tools and training to succeed in these jobs, and we invest in the public infrastructure and neighborhood development projects that make the city a great place to live, work, and do business. So New York City's economic strength comes from the interactions and cross-pollinations of a diverse set of stakeholders. Um, that's where my team, the partnerships team, comes into place. So we manage the relationships between uh, domestic and international businesses, that can be your future customer base, um, academic institutions like NYU, Columbia, uh, CUNY, uh, community-based organizations including workforce development operators that can help set up a pipeline, a hi hiring pipeline for you, private investors that can help secure the capital you need to grow, and the public sector to unlock unique partnership opportunities with the city. Uh, this includes our, you know, enormous Department of Education or Office of Media and Entertainment. Um, we bring the stakeholders at the uh, to the table, forging the connections that bring businesses, jobs, and opportunities to New York. And when I wrap up the presentation, I'll just quickly go through some of the specific ways um, we could help you connect to those uh, the folks I just mentioned. So simply put, we're, we're a unique organization uh, because New York is, is such a unique city. Um, but uh, brass tacks, when it comes to expanding your company to the US, what makes New York City different? Well, first off, and obvious, we are the largest US city um, uh, with over 8 million residents, and we boast the nation's largest uh, labor force at over 4 million workers. We're a huge market. We're home to the nation's biggest consumer base, over 20 million strong. And with a gross municipal product of 1.66 trillion, our economy produces more value than the entire gross state product of Texas. And now if we were a country, zoom out further, our economy would be the 10th largest in the world. And that's on par with our neighbors to the North Canada, as well as the entire country of, of Russia. And New York City is of course also defined by our diversity. So since our founding over 400 years ago, we have been an international city, the place where people from all over the world come to fulfill their highest ambitions. So 37% of our population is born abroad. 
and immigrants comprise over 47% of our workforce. So on the streets of New York, you can hear over 200 languages being spoken by people from every country in the world. Simply put, New York City is built for business. It's all here. We have the customer base, the suppliers, the talent, and access to capital for any business to thrive with the partnerships team at EDC, as I mentioned, ready to connect you to it all. And looking forward, New York City is on a further drive to diversify its economy across all growing industries. And that's really led us to where we are today in 2020. Um, we are a tech city. Um, in the US, we think about Silicon Valley first, but, but New York City is the clear number two and gaining ground every day. Um, and we're unique in our own ways. So we have the second most valuable tech system in the world, and that's, that's made up over 9,000 startups valued about $150 billion. We also have the second largest pool of tech talent globally with 330,000 New Yorkers working in the tech industry. And we have the second largest venture capital pool in the world reaching over 15 billion in 2019. And the five pillars of success are due to our talent, our customer base, our funding, our affordable workspaces and innovation. And I'll try to just quickly breeze through these as we are about to wrap up. Um, so I'll, I'll really go fast So I wanna make sure we give everyone time here. So um, not only do we have 3,300,000 people in tech, but we have the fastest rate to hire engineers in the US. That's always my favorite um, tech talent uh, fun fact. About three weeks faster on average than Silicon Valley. And the quality and depth of our talent pool is simply unmatched. New York City also has the supporting talent you need for success, including the best in legal, accounting, finance, advertising, and more. And that support factor always comes in. Um, one other fun fact I'd like to mention is we have over 1 million uh, college students or higher education students in, in, in New York City proper, which is more than the entire city of Boston as a comparison. Um, I'm going to quickly jump through here. I want to make sure we finish at 10.15. Um, but I will give you the in-depth overview of the tech economy um, when you meet in March. A few other uh, good, good news pointers, though. I will say that um, there's been some great signals through COVID about expansions that have happened in New York. Um, Google recently added about 1.7 million square feet of office space uh, to their corporate campus in Manhattan. Facebook just doubled down, leasing a new 2.2 uh, million square foot building in Midtown. Um, Apple is expanding to a second building here, leasing an over uh, another 200,000 square feet. And Amazon recently made a huge purchase in, in Midtown as well. So great signals um, through the worst of times right now as we try to turn the corner. Um, and then I'll just wrap up with this. Um, these are some of the services that our partnerships team at EDC provides um, that are specific to your expansion. So city-owned properties, as I mentioned, we have over 6 million square meters of property. If it's a good fit for your business, um, we do offer below market rate rents in those properties. The purpose is to create jobs. Um, so we offer that as an opportunity. We also provide private site selection service. So we work with all of our chambers of commerce and there's many in, within the city of New York, as well as, business, as well as business improvement districts to help you find a short list as we do a site selection search across the five boroughs. Um, we have financial incentives advisors that package over the, the, the over 50 city, state and federal level incentives um, for you, um, industry programs that we invest in, like Cyber NYC or LifeSci NYC, we connect you to those. If you're interested in doing business with the city of New York, we help with procurements, um, economic wayfindings to make the economic case for why New York versus another city. We have a team of economists on hold for that. And really, I think the most important one is workforce and academic integration. So we hold relationships with over 100 university presidents and workforce development orgs to help build a talent pipeline. Uh, for your companies. Uh, this applies to connecting to their academic research and, develop, and development wings as well. Um, and in addition, we provide one-on-one -on -one consultation with companies in order to help build your recruiting pipeline once you're here. And I believe I'm over time, so I will wrap up with that. Please uh, contact me direct um, if you have any questions about uh, making the jump and expanding. Here's my email as well as um, our, our website, edc.myc. YMYC that has all the info there, as well as uh, my LinkedIn. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel, for that thorough um, walkthrough uh, of the support. And um, 
and all the all the reasons, particularly why tech companies would would want to work in New York and and be based and have a presence there. It's excellent. And um, I mean, you'll know this anyway, but Glasgow's got a really strong fintech sector from all the big corporations like Morgan Stanley and Barclays, uh, JP Morgan's, etc. But we've got a wealth of small uh, SME fintech business as well and startups. So and, and fintech Scotland who are represented on the call today as well. So we'd be delighted to work with you on an ongoing basis. And thank you for being available and being a partner in this initiative. Great, great to have you on board. Thank you for that. Yeah. Getting through things so quickly as well. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Bob, Bob Fogarty, uh, Vice President Americas Technology for our partners at Scottish Development International. Uh, Bob's going to tell us a wee bit more about why uh, New York and the Eastern Seaboard is an attractive location for Scottish businesses. Over to you, Bob. Okay, uh, thank you and um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm based in, can everybody see my screen, first of all? Yep. All right. Um, so I'm, my name is Bob Fogarty. I'm based in, um, in Boston, which is about a two and a half hour drive from New York City and a much shorter flight, of course. And, um, you know, I've done a lot of business in New York City and parts of my career, um, having been in, the, in tech for, for many years. And, um, you know, I've always loved doing business down there. Um, but as a Bostonian, I have to disclose that um, I am I am born and bred to uh, despise their sports teams. So, but nevertheless, it's a, um, a wonderful place for business. Um, let's see. So I was going to talk about. Um, so, in in the U.S. in fintech. So it, in in our team, the the trade team for for SDI works on a variety of different technology businesses um, from Scotland and, and trying to help them um, form strategy and, and enter the US market. Um, some of us are have been particularly focused on fintech. One of the things that's been obvious about fintech is it's an enormous market in the US, a lot of venture capital money going into various different aspects of fintech. And as you get into fintech, you realize is a something tech associated with all the sub markets within so-called fintech. Uh, this graphic shows just some of those and some of the more popular ones that are that have been generating a lot of VC funding over the years. And as we entered 2020, it was actually slowing down before COVID. There was kind of a cooling off of fintech investment and uh, COVID accelerated that slowdown but then it ramped up very quickly because so many things that fintechs were working on um, were very pertinent to the new world we're all faced with um, in, in terms of COVID and having to do remote banking and so forth. So, so the investment across all these different markets has really uh, ramped up over the last uh, couple of quarters. As far as the U.S. is... is um, Obviously a large country, uh, it's best to think of it in terms of regions, but there's no question uh, as was just previously, previously stated that the hubs of uh, tech, tech in general uh, it is San Francisco, the Bay Area, and uh, New York is a strong number two and has gained a lot in terms of overall tech. And certainly within FinTech, it's, it's the same applies. Uh, in these darker states, if that's, um, visible on the screen, um, those are states that that had more than a billion dollars of, of uh, VC funding into fintechs, specifically into fintechs. So New York, California, led by uh, New York City and San Francisco, respectively, are are certainly the big big areas and the big cities. That said, there's fintech in in the in financial services in general is. Uh, as I said, a regional business. There's a lot of other strong pockets of fintech activity throughout the United States. Boston being uh, one in, that's that's a, a, a strong innovator across many industries, and fintech is a particular strength as well. Uh, but there's no question New York is is uh, wonderful and probably the best place, just in terms of. Um, access to customers because pretty much any financial institution in the markets they serve, as you think of it, whether it be commercial banking, investment banking, wealth management, et cetera, they 
the the largest and most prominent companies in the country and in the world either have a, a headquarters uh, or major uh, presence in in New York City. So the access to customers and markets is is self evident. There's also uh, an abundance of fintechs of over 500 uh, as of the beginning of 2020. Um, and there's also a lot of these, these companies actually have corporate labs or, or uh, accelerators that they've invested in jointly with um, other companies or uh, along with uh, government entities in order to try to help accelerate fintech innovation. One uh, that I'll mention in particular is um, there's a Scottish company called Provise that worked with MasterCard uh, in their Start Path program. And MasterCard is a New York company. And um, they, uh, Provise was able to get uh, off the ground and gain some momentum. And ultimately this year they raised, uh, I believe it's a Series B round or Series A round of 11 billion, 11 million uh, pounds. So it's a real success story. Um, as far as the markets in uh, the, when you start to carve out like right, where do fintechs try to sell? There's one of the things I've certainly learned in looking at this space is it's enormous. There is, I just can't believe the scale of the business. Um, having been in tech for a long time, um, I hadn't really spent a lot of time on the financial services side of things, but as you start peeling the onion as to where, uh, what are the sizes of these markets and, and what types of fintechs are emerging to solve problems in these different market sectors, it's, it's pretty staggering, at least in the US. Um, and what I think the good news part of this is that these are large industries. They're um, industries that often have uh, antiquated technology that is um, causing, uh, op you know, creating opportunities for fintechs to either disrupt current business models or to enhance and, and help these, these entities transform. Um, among the Scottish companies I've looked at, most of them are more focused on the transformation side of it than, than the, you know, trying to upend a major bank, for example. Um, and I think there's a ton of opportunities in, in all these different sectors. So take commercial banking, for example, uh, close to a $700 billion in billion dollars in revenue. It's actually down this year. It would have been over 700 billion. Um, tons of assets under management that get deployed into various different products, lending products pr predominantly. Um, but commercial banking in the US, just to put it in perspective, you've probably all heard of the major household names like uh, Bank of America and um, in companies like uh, Wells Fargo and US Bank. And those are major national uh, banks and, uh, and in some cases international banks. But there's, there's actually over 10,000 banks and credit unions uh, operating in the commercial bank banking sector. So a lot of them are regional and that they operate over multiple states. And then there's an abundance of them that are more like what we call local or community banks or credit unions that operate within a state. And, um, and these, are, these are all uh, you know, very, very well established entities in, in need of, of transformation. Um, wealth management, huge industry, investment banking, not as big as the others, but hugely profitable, but that's your traditional IPO and, and M&A portions. A lot of times big entities like the Goldman Sachs actually operates in all three of these areas. And then there's the insurance sector, which is um, massive in its own right and has two main areas, life insurance and annuities, and then property and casualty. So for things like homes and business insurance and, and vehicles and things like that. Um, and I put the payments in here because payments actually is the most um, interesting market right now within fintech in terms of like dollars flowing into it and the number of challenges and opportunities in it. And, um, and I think, you know, obviously banks derive revenue from payments and uh, transferring money back and forth, but there's of course the, the credit card aspect of it. Um, 
I'll, I'm not going to dwell on these and go through all of the different parts of fintech, but just to point out within lending, like bank lending, for example, some of the things that fintechs are doing to help um, these uh, bank banks become more effective at lending is with areas like credit uh, credit risk scoring. So becoming more granular using AI and machine learning to do a better job of, of uh, assessing risk and ultimately pricing to the end consumer. Um, there's This also drives auto decisioning. So things like, uh, whereas there's an obvious approval or rejection, just get that, automate that process so as not to burden uh, underwriters with, with an, uh, and have them focus on the, the areas that really need to be analyzed for decisioning. Um, underbanked or unbanked, is viewed as a an opportunity because banking in the U.S. is traditionally focused on credit bureau scoring, identifying who's a prime or close to prime, um, you know, in terms of a credit score, and then basing approval on that. What fintechs are enabling is augmenting uh, this, you know, essentially the lending process with a lot of other data in order to uh, to to make better decisions and serve this this market a lot better. So I think I'm running up against it with time. So I'm going to skip over this, but just one point payments, ton of things going on in it. Um, it's a it's a whole area to drill into. Uh, there's, there's vertical market solutions emerging. A company or with a so-called unicorn corn in the Boston area called Toast is um, um, worth over a billion dollars and entirely focused on the restaurant industry, but is, is taking a, a payment solution and really become kind of an overall business intelligence solution for restaurants. But there's a lot of that type of innovation and in, in much others going on in the payments area and as well as all these other fintech uh, subsectors. And I'll wrap up with what I would say on coming to the US and trying to compete in New York uh, and if you say you were focused on banking, just as a, you know, let's just stipulate that it's important to identify uh, an area or two of strength, even if you can do a broad set of things. But I think with the abundance of fintechs and the challenges getting share of mind within the customer base, you really need to focus on an area, whether it be in the back office or, or in the type of lending and, and get after that. And as far as the strategy goes, and then obviously targeting which which of the banks do do you want to center on the large ones, the household names that are going to obviously require a much more strategic and lengthy selling process, or do you focus on trying to get into the infrastructure suppliers to some of these smaller banks that don't have large IT and R and D groups where they can all in effect become a channel. Um, so these are just some thoughts on on how to get after the fintech opportunity in the U.S. And um, like I said, I'm running out of time, but just uh, my contact information is in the upper right. Emil uh, Jandoric is based in the, in the Bay Area uh, and also works extensively in fintech. Um, there's uh, at upcoming conferences in is Boston Fintech Week in, in March and New, more importantly, New York Fintech Week, which is a, a huge event is going on in early April. Um, and with that, I will we'll, uh, turn it over to to the uh, whoever the next speaker is. Thanks, Thank Bob. You. No, excellent. Thank you. First class, uh, again, a, a great tour de force around uh, the support that uh, you and SDI can provide and great insight and scale to the support in the fintech sector. And it made me quickly think of a couple of uh, things that um, Firstly, in Scotland, we're, we're not completely unique, but we're very, very lucky to have such a brilliant um, collaboration from different organisations. And Scottish Development International are always one of those partnership organisations that the Chamber Network work with, Scottish Enterprise, Scottish Government, Scottish Chambers, British Chambers. So we're very lucky to have those support bodies and to have the insight and knowledge um, and support you can provide, Bob. And actually something I should just quickly say is we've also got a President's Network the Glasgow Chamber of Commerce and interestingly quite a few of the people I can think of in the, in the greater New York area are from banking and fintech they're not on the call today but people like Ken Donnelly people like uh, Ross Hamilton and James Heggie 
So no surprise that a lot of them are from banking and the fintech sector. Um, Mary Campbell has reminded us that New York City, Daniel, can be a fun, is a fun city too. I can testify to that. Well done, Mary. Absolutely. Um, maybe we can talk about that later, but um, the St. Andrews Society uh, events are probably the absolute highlight for me. And I, I've had the privilege of being at that event in 2016. It was brilliant. So um, we're, we're now going to change tack a little bit. We're going to hand over to Michelle, Michelle Gabriel. Um, and Michelle, as I said earlier on, is the, a professor for sustainable fashion strategy at Glasgow Caledonian New York College. You have an excellent campus uh, in Worcester Street in Soho in downtown Manhattan. So without further ado, over to Michelle. Obviously, COP26 is coming to Glasgow in November uh, 2021. So sustainability is absolutely at the core of what we're doing. And we're delighted to have Michelle as a speaker to talk about fashion and sustainability. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Richard. Um, let me get myself set up here. All right. Um, can everyone see? Are we good? Awesome. Um, thank you so much for having me today. I'm really excited to talk to all of you about New York City, about fashion, about sustainability, all things I'm deeply passionate about. I come to you today from Brooklyn, so very happy to be here. Um, uh, as Richard said, I am a professor, um, an adjunct professor at Glasgow Caledonian New York College, um, and I teach sustainable fashion business strategy. Outside of my teaching, I am an impact and sustainability strategist, um, and I've worked in the fashion industry for a long time and adjacent industries as well. So let's talk about New York City. Let's talk about fashion in New York City. New York City is home to one of the best and largest pools of creative talent, retail space in high traffic areas, some of the top manufacturers and ateliers in fashion, some of the best fashion schools internationally and locally to the US, and more headquarters of fashion brands and retailers than any other city in the US. Like China, uh, the US industry, uh, fashion industry began as a manufacturing hub, not as the creative and design epicenter that it is today. Um, and so that really informs the culture and the tenor of our fashion industry. Accord, uh, New York City remains a global fashion power, uh, despite the challenges we face today uh, due to COVID. More fashion designers work in New York City than anywhere else in the country. Uh, we have approximately $185,000, or excuse me, 185,000 employed in the fashion industry in New York City alone. That doesn't even include the adjacent uh, communities of New Jersey or, or outside the five boroughs, um, as outlined by our previous speakers. Um, New York Fashion Week is a economic behemoth. It garners more income than the Super Bowl in the United States at $600 million, um, and that happens twice a year. Uh, it is also more um, profitable than its counterparts in Paris, Milan, and London combined. Um, according to the city of New York, an estimated 900 fashion companies are headquartered in New York City, which is also home to more than 75 major fashion trade shows and thousands of showrooms. So it's really an international and, um, and national for the U.S. epicenter of fashion. A little bit about the U.S. fashion market, um, of which we are at the helm. In the U.S., um, consumers spent about $380 billion on apparel and footwear as of 2017, making it the biggest apparel fashion market in the world, though China is catching up. Together, millennials and Gen Z consumers represent about $350 billion of consumer spending in the US alone. The United States are the largest importers of uh, fashion related products in the world, um, mostly concentrated on manufactured apparel, and that is value at, valued at about $105 billion. The average price per unit, though, in the U.S. is about $16.33 as of 2020, um, compared to $18.39 in the U.K., so just as a little bit of a point of difference. And the volume is, is very different in the U.S. as well. So as of 2020, um, consumers on average buy about 62.27 pieces annually of fashion, um, but that is down from 2019 pre-COVID of 89 0.15, so they're very big purchasers. Um, and again, compared to the UK at about 52.44. So it's a big market. 
So how do brands that come to the U.S. market, to the New York market specifically, how do they differentiate? Because it is a, it is a crowded market. Um, we don't have a lot of heritage, you know, unlike the U.K. and their brands. We don't have a lot of legacy. Um, so we have to compete on a couple of other things. And we recommend that businesses that come to compete in our space do so as well. You know, we compete on fashion. And I mean that in the sense of novelty. We compete on brand. That's probably one of the biggest areas in which we compete. You can buy pants from anywhere. Why buy from Everlane instead of Gap? Um, US customers buy for brand alignment. They buy for uh, means to class participate. They buy to identity build for themselves um, and as a way to form in groups and out groups. And increasingly as a way to express their values. Innovation is a big one. Um, that can really set a brand apart. How does a brand reinvent the concept of fashion or the fashion brand? This is really at the forefront as well due to COVID and the changes that are, it is um, imposing on the industry. Um, how are they utilizing performance? Um, how are they reinventing culture? All of this falls under innovation. And as I kind of outlined on the previous slide, price is a big point um, to take note of. The US is not like the French for whom style is a cultural expectation. We're a much more functional market. Um, we use clothes as a tool rather than an ends unto itself. So um, we are price conscious first, but you can't compete on price alone. So let's talk about sustainability and circularity. Um, these are not concepts that are native to the fashion industry, as I'm sure some of you are aware, but these are frameworks of understanding that can be applied to the fashion industry and, can, and increasingly are necessary to apply in order to compete at all in the market. Small, you know, little definitions just to make sure we're all in the same playing field. Um, this is my own definition. Sustainability for the fashion market for me is about shifting from incremental change or mitigation frameworks, business as usual, one might say, um, aimed at reducing harm to active and intentional value creation, aimed at developing new ways of working that inherently manage known issues and externalities. Circularity, um, which is a facet of sustainability, it is a tangible manifestation that is actionable within your business, um, you know, really brought to the forefront by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and otherwise known as the circular economy is about looking beyond the current make, take, or excuse me, take, make, waste, extractive industrial model. Um, and it aims to redefine growth, um, focusing on positive society-wide benefits. It entails gradually decoup decoupling economic activity from the consumption of finite resources and designing waste out of a system. Um, it's, it's underpinned by three main concepts, designing waste out and designing pollution out, keeping products and materials in use for longer periods of time, and regenerating natural, excuse me, regenerating natural systems. So sustainability is the vision at the top level, and circularity is the practice. You may be familiar with this. This is the Ellen MacArthur, you know, butterfly model. Um, this is not a fashion specific um, infographic, but it speaks to, you know, really incorporating value and potential waste streams back into your system to, uh, for various outcomes. And we'll talk about those briefly. So how does New York and the US fashion market value and make manifest its value of sustainability and circularity? Value and ease are still significant purchase drivers for U.S. fashion consumers, but sustainability is moving past nice to have and is increasingly a requirement to compete at all in the market. Consumers are increasingly values driven and they're holding brands accountable through call out culture, um, through their purchasing behavior and, um, you know, requiring sustainability and social impact as a baseline. We can kind of categorize in four main ways. Um, that brands can make manifest these um, concepts and benefit themselves and engage with their consumers. So sustainability as a value add. Consumers come for the primary value your brand might offer, uh, but they stay for the sustainability and circularity. According to the Boston Consulting Group's 2020 report, Fashion's Big Reset, uh, demand will accelerate for sustainability and purposeful brands, and moreover, consumers will favor brands with purpose. Um, and sustainability will become a minimum requirement. Sustainability is differentiator. 
like I said, it is a really crowded market. Um, doesn't mean there's not a space for you to compete, but it means that when you adopt sustainability and circularity endeavors, you really uh, create a space for yourself that is unique. Um, sustainability as risk management. You know, right now, I'm sure you're aware, everything moves very, very fast. Um, there's a lot of volatility that comes with swift moving um, systems. Um, quick changing global dynamics, um, climate change, all of these things are affecting business and are affecting bottom line considerations. And so um, when you consider sustainability and circularity, you really bring those into your business um, in order to mitigate risk and, and allow um, a future outcome for your business that might not be potential if you do not consider such things. Um, choosing not to attack, excuse me, choosing not to tackle sustainability and social impact issues leaves businesses open to catastrophe that can immediately affect the bottom line, both outside issues um, like COVID-19 that we're seeing um, and climate change leave businesses open to being a victim um, of call out culture or being viewed as out of touch, which is really the kiss of death in the fashion industry in the US. And lastly, sustainability can be a new paradigm for your business. Um, it can be the impetus for building new rules, for competing and allowing for a differentiated position for those that are early to the party. Um, you can see through increasingly high demand customers have for fashion businesses around sustainability and circularity and the challenges brands have in adopting comprehensive strategies. Um, it, it will only get us so far. So new dynamics really have to be created um, and we rely on businesses to do that. According to the Sustainable Apparel Coalition's April 2020 report, um, weaving a new, uh, excuse me, weaving a better future, rebuilding a more sustainable fashion industry, climate disruption has made the fashion business model itself vulnerable, which supply chains, which threatens supply chains um, with natural disasters and the availability and pricing of raw materials. So it's really um, behooves you as a business to bring some of these into the core operations and your concepts of, that really surround your brand and your business because it'll really set you apart. So in summation, how do we look forward? Why is sustainability and circularity so important to compete in the New York market? Sustainability and circularity are the future of innovation and differentiation for an entire global fashion market, not just New York, but especially New York. And they ensure there is a future market to compete in. So it both, you know, secures your ability to compete as a business in the future and allows you a unique position now. Anyway, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. It was wonderful to spend my morning, your afternoon with you. Um, and I will pass it back. Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, from Brooklyn as well. Great. A great part of the world. Uh, no, thank you so much. It couldn't be more relevant um, for for us and for some of our attendees this afternoon and our partnership with Glasgow Caledonian University is absolutely uh, rock solid. We've got a great uh, partnership with the team at Glasgow Cali Uni, so delighted to have you on board. And with COP26 coming to Glasgow next year, I know a circular Glasgow team based at the Glasgow Chamber of Commerce uh, are looking forward to all the opportunities that that gives us and this mission as well. So and that neatly segues into our next speaker, which is uh, Mark. Mark from Harris Tweed, who marks the creative director of one of our most famous and successful and innovative uh, fashion brands um, and has been successful in a number of uh, overseas territories, including America, and has been active in New York. So, Mark, over to you. And Mark is also on the panel of the international advisors for Glasgow Caledonian University as well. So, very neat segue over to you, Mark. Thank you, uh, Richard, and thanks to all the speakers. Uh, thus far. Um, if you just bear with me, I'm going to get my screen up. Uh, yeah, it was fantastic to listen to um, Michelle there. Uh, sustainability is now ubiquitous in the fashion industry, uh, including at Harris Tweed, who, despite being seen as a, a heritage uh, company, as a heritage brand, it's no excuse um, for not trying to put in place the innovation and engage with the whole sustainability debate in a positive manner. I want to talk about really our experience in uh, exporting to the United States. And it's really uh, pertinent that today's focus is on New York because that is where the majority of Harris Tweed goes. Can I just check that everybody got that slide change? 
Hello. Sorry, sorry Max. I don't think we have your slides up yet. No. Okay. I am going to come back and just do that again. Could you hear me there at least? Yeah, yeah I'll be here. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. I should just say while we've, we've got a second, if anybody's got any questions, please put them in the chat function. Um, we'll be able to unmute later on and, and get live questions as well. But if you prefer not to do a live question, just pop it in the chat and we can, we can pose the question to the speakers. Thanks. Fortunately, I'm not quite sure if there's a technical difficulty, but I'm only getting options and desktop and whiteboards so it's not actually automatically slipping to my mark do you want me to i can share your your slides if you want if you can put my deck in yeah i'm not quite sure what's uh what's happened to you sarah that'd be fantastic thank you yeah um that's it right can everyone see that yeah yeah we've got it yeah Okay, um, if we can just go to the first slide then, Sarah, and just with the New York loves a good story. And what we need to do to make ourselves relevant uh, at Harris Tweed in the New York fashion market is really double down on the history and the unique nature of Harris Tweed. And this is an example of uh, one of the key narratives, the idea that you know, everything at Harris Tweed is based around community, but also around the landscape, which inspires the cloth. So if you look at the, the left photograph uh, there of the uh, lichen over in the west coast of the Outer Hebrides, the island of Lewis, that then becomes inspiration for uh, the fabric, which then goes on into the fashion market, in this case, uh, apparel. That is key to what we have to bring to make an impact in the New York fashion industry, whether it's at the classic Ivy League style brands like Brooks Brothers, uh, Ralph Lauren, uh, or, or even the modern day version of J. Crew. Uh, but more importantly, uh, in the fashion, the absolute acute fashion industry, which uh, the innovative fashion industry, which uh, Michelle was alluding to uh, earlier, companies like Supreme that we work with as well, that is core to our success. Just a bit about Harris Tweed moving on, uh, it is a unique place. You can see some of the most uh, outstanding, incredible beaches in the world are in the Outer Hebrides. Um, I would be lying if I said there was more than 10 days a year where you could maybe uh, go for a swim in them because it's a very cold place. Um, it can often um, be days with brutal weather, but for every day of um, you know, strong winds and rain, you, you do tend to, to get uh, a beautiful day as well. So it really is an incredible place and we have to um, bring that into our story as well. Just move on there, please. A unique product. I mean, Harris Tweed is beautifully complex. Uh, you can see from here, this is part of the, the tying in process. You know, the industry almost uh, became not obsolete, but it became under so much pressure uh, back in the 1980s uh, when, you know, cheaper synthetic uh, fabrics, or not even synthetic fabrics, but the production, the you know, mass production levels that made Harris Tweed less competitive. Uh, when that was uh, initiated, we really suffered. But in the last 15 years, the demand for quality and the demand for transparency and demand for a story has really benefited Harris Tweed. And details like this, which would have seemed relatively absurd to somebody trying to um, in increase productivity, have now become a beautiful part of our story, which we can take out to market. Next slide, please. From the land comes the cloth is the core mantra of what we do and what we have with Harris Tweed. You know, dyeing wool rather than yarn sets the tone for this co complex process. We really do have a quest for a perfect product. Uh, there's patience of talented men and women and manually powered looms. So there's a real soulful dynamic with Harris Tweed. You know, there's a real symbiosis between weaver and, and loom and, uh, and cloth and landscape. Quality control is ensured by the hand and the eye 
rather than just the bleep of a computer. Uh, moving on to a skilled artisan. This again is key and I think anybody in Scotland is looking to export to the United States, you have to look for those key elements in your process that you might not see as being particularly important, but they form core dimensions of your story that you can then take to market. And I think that's the case at Harris Tweed. So, I mean, I can definitely recall from a meeting in New York explaining about how, you know, we don't use Pantone because to use Pantone would be to, you know, be part of the system, part of the fashion system. And we always saw ourselves as being slightly out with that um, because we wanted to have our own unique colours so that we could more accurately represent um, the landscape and the, the summer macker flowers of Harris Tweed. So this picture, I think, depicts that where our head of design is actually mixing uh, two different wool uh, fibres to create a very distinctive uh, finished pink that will go on to uh, a unique cloth. Uh, next slide, please, Saren, thank you. Trademark Orb, you know, if you have got any form of intellectual property or anything that gives your product, you know, that unique um, dimension, which is protected at a European level, Obviously, in Harris II's case, we're very, very fortunate to have 150 years of heritage. And obviously, the Harris Tweed Orb, which is a world-renowned symbol, we can use that as branding. But that's not to say that, you know, you can't be a fast starter. If you look at what companies in the food and drinks industry have done um, all the way from Johnny Walker and having that um, striding man symbol to what Brewdog and some of our food companies have done in latter years. Uh, getting that stamp, getting that anything around a trademark, anything uh, around a process whereby your product has got a significance uh, and a unique set of intellectual property, I think will do very, very well uh, in uh, New York and the wider United States. Uh, next slide. Partnerships are absolutely key. Um, you can see just on the, the top half there, obviously we have partnered with, with Johnny Walker Black Label. That was a great narrative because their heritage and our heritage came together and you can then put that out to market. And the more prosaic dimension, obviously, when looking to uh, export to New York, and I think the previous speakers have given great outlines and great information on this already, but I think you have to have a plan in mind. You know, Do you want agent, distributor or, or wholesaler? Or a mixture of the, the three. Um, direct to consumer models will still require partnerships on logistics uh, and shipping. In other words, I think basically you, regardless of what your plan is, you do need to have somebody in New York. And I think the Chamber of Commerce are particularly good on that. Um, in the past decade, uh, I've also been on trade missions with uh, you know, SDI, who obviously I think their offices are still based up in, in Boston, but have got very good contacts in uh, New York. And of course, um, there's also the consulate, the UK consulate as well, um, very helpful in both uh, both New York and, uh, and, and other cities across the US. Just to finish off here, um, carefully, oh, sorry, just one second. Sorry. Yeah, just carefully created associations with key brands and influential people. Uh, very, very important. I think um, Richard mentioned this in Andrew Society. Um, there will be other business um, specific uh, groups, uh, either digital or uh, traditional um, groups that you may want to engage with as well. Um, and just uh, again, reflect on your existing sales and brand partnerships, what shines brightest. Next slide, please. Yeah, great. Um, New York and the American way. Uh, we have to really find that right balance of, of making Harris Tweed applicable and modern, but just telling it in a narrative. And it's, you know, it can be overstated, the, the cultural um, ties with, with, with Scotland, you know, going away back um, to, to the mass uh, periods of, of migration, you know, uh, there will be a very receptive audience to, to Scotland and indeed Scottish people, which I think we all have and indeed will benefit from. And then just narratives, you know, like that whole frontier dimension of excitement. Um, as you can see from the photo here, that's actually one of our British clients, but they very much tap into that, um, as do uh, other customers, you know, for example, uh, Ralph Lauren uh, with their um, double RL brand, you know, they really tap into the heritage. There are obviously many other clients that we deal with in the New York fashion industry as well, 
But uh, you know that that core story has to be there in order for us to maximise the potential of the uh, other other types of Harris Tweed. Next slide, please. Again, just a, a classic example: the Converse All Star Boot. Um, I think. Well, I certainly know that uh, the shoe town is up in uh, Massachusetts. Um, so, Bob, I think you probably know a little bit more. That's possibly where these Converse were designed, if not even made. But that classic dimension of um, the total um, being greater than the sum of the individual parts was exemplified by this uh, particular collaboration. I'll move on, please. Just uh, I, I showed how you know we probably went to five or six trade missions over the last, last 12 years. With that in mind, I always had a dream that we would do something with Tom Brown, who's not only one of the best fashion designers in New York, but possibly even in the world, probably even in the world. And uh, yeah, he, in terms of sustainability, although he's high, high-end luxury, has got a great uh, showcase as well because he's making uh, fashion in the form of art and you don't throw art away. So that really was a big, big um, step for Harris Tweed and it's now a perennial client as well. So, you know, it just goes to show with a bit of pers perseverance uh, that some great and magical things can happen in New York. Next slide, please. I want to finish off in sustainability. Um, you know, I think Michelle really did a fantastic job in, in covering the various aspects of sustainability, uh, the ubiquitous nature of it. For me, you know, it's a multifaceted, it's difficult to, to define and it cannot be ignored. If you do have an ethical or carbon market advantage with your product, make that key. COP26, as uh, Richard has of course mentioned, will have an immense international attention as we go out through uh, 2021. We have to maximise this opportunity. Uh, evolution is better than revolution. Uh, incremental changes make good content. Next slide. Again, just conscious of, of time here, but I want to finish off on this. And this is something that I think we can all uh, attain at least one facet of these um, sustainable development goals um, set by the uh, United Nations. Of course, the UN being based uh, in New York, COP26 being in Glasgow uh, at the end of the year. And I think it's something that we can, we can draw, draw tap into regardless of whether you're a startup company um, whereby you've managed to put sustainable and ethical dimensions at your core. That dimension of incremental change, you know, once you actually see these 17 uh, SDGs, it becomes a little bit more accessible. Even at Harris Tweed, you know, we've got a fantastic, strong, sustainable story, uh, first and foremost, with the fact that we sustain uh, a community of, of hardworking people and a very remote and sometimes difficult socioeconomic environment, which is, of course, the Outer Hebrides. But there's other elements of our process, you know, that we've uh, wanted to, to improve upon and having this set of uh, goals really does that make that a little bit easier. We're all on a sustainable journey. And uh, as stated before, uh, I do think that evolution, uh, you know, where possible with established companies does um, trump uh, evolution. With that, I'm going to hand over. I do know we're a little bit beyond time. Uh, I'm Mark Hogarth and the easiest way to, um, yeah, mail, mail to me would probably over LinkedIn. And, uh, you know, I do a lot of work with uh, Glasgow Caledonia University. So I'm sure I will be speaking to many of you in that capacity or indeed uh, in other aspects of the work, the great work that the Chamber of Commerce continue to do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, so eloquently put, and I love that phrase, uh, great and magical things can happen in New York. That was so well put and never tire of hearing the fabulous uh, Harris Tweed story, the innovation, the sustainability is ubiquitous, as you and Michelle have both said as well. Um, and I, I love the whole, uh, from the land uh, comes the cloth, the fabulous story and so successful in the States and in other countries around the world. So thank you so much for being on board. We're so pleased that this mission is honing in on these two fabulous sectors, you know, both sustainable fashion and fintech as well. So great to have you along this afternoon, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to um, Graham Dobbin, Chief Exec and International Management and Change Consultant at Centive in, uh, in New York. Um, Graham's going to give us a little story uh, in terms of being a Scot based in New York. I'm seeing quite a lot of chat now, um, which we'll come to shortly as well. So we'll hand over to Graham and then we'll get the questions going and it's your chance to ask the panel. 
your particular questions, but keep the chat coming as well. Uh, but over to you, Graeme, in the meantime. Great, thank, thanks, Richard. Um, I'm, I'm very aware that, that, that time's tight, so I'll keep this tight. I'm just uh, going to give you maybe a bit of a practical view of what it's like to, to come across and set up a business in New York. Uh, I took the plunge three years ago at 50 years old to sell everything up and, and come over to New York. I would never advise anybody else to do it that way, but I did. I know everybody's sitting out there going, it can't be 50, surely. Um, this was the view from our first office in downtown and, uh, and just at the bottom of Broadway. We saw this every morning, so there was a big change. Moved over with no clients, a brand new business, and I knew six people, which uh, I think, counting yesterday, three of them still speak to me. Um, and we set up a business doing leadership development, change management, which there's a lot of this year, and business consultancy. And probably one of the first things I needed to learn in New York that I hadn't appreciated was everybody's been hustled here. Everybody's been hustled, <laughs> it's kind of expected. So as much as it's really welcoming, there's an appropriate cynicism. And that's something we need to overcome. Um, so it was something I realized in the first few months and I had to work out what, what, what did we really add in value and how could we be flexible? And there was something that happened to change. It's interesting that we're working together with the Chamber of Commerce because the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce asked me to run a session for them at the last minute. The speaker had, had fallen out um, they had a hundred people and they wanted to run this big networking meeting. So I stepped in and I did an hour's talk. I can talk quite easily. Um, and it went down a storm. I just did things that we would normally do in the UK, but a lot of it hadn't been seen here. That kind of gave me one of the triggers that, that we've got maybe a lot more value to add than we would necessarily immediately think. So I turned into the yes man. I was the guy who said yes to anything. So I was always the one that filled in at the last minute, um, which took me to the, the stock exchange. I was at the opening bell. Um, I ended up down in Washington, D.C. on Capitol Hill on uh, a meeting, my first ever time in Washington. Um, if somebody needed a trainer, I was there. I did it. I did podcasts. I was, uh, uh, Richard's mentioned the St. Andrew's Society. I ended up as a standard bearer walking up 6th Avenue in a kilt with a, with a salt tire <laughs> during St. Andrew's Day. I just was there constantly. What that brought was a consistency for everyone. So people are cynical, but what they're looking for is just that consistency that you're going to turn up, you're going to be there constantly for them. And that's where things changed for me massively. About a year in, huge opportunities came. So New York's really very similar to other places. It's just the size of opportunities are really different. Um, one person at that Manhattan Chamber of Commerce meeting had come across to me and said, you're Scottish. And I said, well done. Thank you for noticing. And he went, Glass uh, New York is the Glasgow of the USA. It was the first thing he said. I said, what do you mean? He said, we've got that swagger as well. And he said, it was, it was strange for hearing the New Yorker saying it says we've got the gallusness. And that's kind of what you've got in New York. You've got that, that street wiseness as well that people are really, really proud of. So so it is actually genuinely a small business community, but one thing that, that Mark's also just mentioned was that being Scottish is different. It's the first time that a Pfeiffer, in my, in, in my view, has ever been called exotic. And I've been called exotic a couple of times. There's lots of Irish, lots of Australian, um, lots of Italian, but not so many Scots, even though we've got a huge heritage here. Um, so where's it taken? And, and I, I, I'm, I'm really cognizant of, of how this might be taken. So this isn't a big I am. This is just kind of where the business has gone in the last last two, two and a half years. And we've held meetings at, at the Rockefeller Center, Chrysler Building. I've been working with fintech people in Wall Street, uh, World Trade Center. So that was the first part. The other part is the kind of logos that we've been dealing with. From having no customers, this is who we currently deal with. Um, it's also brought in opportunities. New Yorkers are so generous. When you're there, when you're working with it, the opportunities come your way. Um, I've, I've actually worked in South Africa, Australia, Brazil, and Mexico, all because of contacts I've made in New York. So when you get into the business community here, it's just phenomenal. Um, we've done sales. I, I, look, I'm a guy from a scheme, a housing scheme in Resize. I never thought for one moment that I would be working with the US Army and emotional intelligence 
um, working with a nationwide furniture manufacturer on sales, telling New Yorkers or showing New Yorkers how to sell. Uh, Google, I worked with uh, a lot of senior managers there, about 60 senior managers on how they present. And BMW, we're now heading up the American, the US side of their Experience Leaders Program. All this has come from just people we've met in the last couple of years. Um, a couple of other things that have come as well. And uh, this, is, this is from uh, just meeting people here. Now got a, a, a show on talkradio.nyc, which I've managed to bring in some really good Scottish leaders to contribute to that. We've just been on a, a national television series as a business consultant short comeback coach for Verizon. That was filmed just two months ago. All of this has come by showing consistency and just being that little bit different. So as much as everybody else has said, you know, plan it out, I could never plan for these things. So I suppose the, 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 the big thing that I would suggest is don't underestimate what we've already got. I know coming to one of the world's largest cities might seem overwhelming at times, or it's just that we want to sell. We've got a lot of value to add and never overestimate how it's done here. You know, there's not a lot of difference. Um, take every single opportunity. Um, and but the big thing about New York, talent's encouraged. They really want talented people here. So when they see that, they grab it with open arms. So with that time, I'm happy to answer any questions afterwards. If anybody wants to connect with me and ask any questions at all, just the, on the practical side, I'm really easy to find on LinkedIn. I think there's three Graham Dobbins in the world. <laughs> Brilliant, Graham. Thank you very much. Um, and actually, one of my best oldest friends in Edinburgh is called Kenny Dobbins. So I don't know if you're related to Kenny, but there we go. No, so I'm not. We, know, we, do know, we do know the Dobbins. But listen, brilliant to hear the story and, and you know, those, those strands of being different and unique, not overestimating things as well. So thank you very much for that. And I'm sure we'll get some questions going in a second. Sarah's just going to quickly um, give us some practical uh, logistical next steps. Sarah, over to you and then Q&A. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so as you all know, I'm Saren and I work on the international team at Glasgow Chamber. Um, and just before we go on to the Q&A, I just wanted to give everyone a very brief overview of what the trade mission is going to look like in March. Um, so as Richard mentioned, it's going to be held from the 23rd to 24th of March next year. Um, and it will be focused obviously on the fintech and sustainable fashion sectors. So. Really, it's the opportunity for around eight to 12 Scottish companies to participate. Um, and obviously in non-COVID times, we would be out in the market in person, but unfortunately because of the travel restrictions, everything's going to be virtual. Um, so just to give you some background of what to expect over the two days, there's gonna be the opportunity to join group sessions. So there'll be a market awareness session, which will provide a more in-depth overview of the New York uh, market and the business landscape and it will also provide information about policy and the differences in culture and then there's also going to be the chance to join industry specific um, sessions in this uh, sustainable fashion and fintech sectors and as we've heard today there'll also be um, exam real life examples of companies who have been there and done it and have um, been successful in the market. So apart from the group sessions, and I think this is probably one of the areas that adds the most value, um, is the business to business meetings. And this is really a chance for our Scottish companies to meet one on one with potential buyers and distributors, clients in the New York market. And what we'll do is when we've received applications um, and when we have our kind of finalised uh, list of delegates, we'll then be working with the companies to make sure that we um, identify appropriate businesses um, and match you um, so that we add the most value as possible. And normally we guarantee about two meetings per Scottish business. Um, and I would say we also encourage uh, companies to organise their own meetings um, if there are specific companies they'd like to connect with. And I think this is probably easier to do when you're actually physically in the market because there's free time on these trade missions and you can kind of organise your own meetings. But even virtually, we'd still encourage companies to do that. So um, how do you apply? So the applications um, are already open and the submission deadline is the 22nd of January. So if you are interested, if you're um, one of a company on here today and you would 
like to join us, then do get in touch and I can send over an application form um, to you. And I think that's really everything um, from the trade mission point of view. But before we go on to the q and I just want to very briefly introduce our colleagues from the Scottish Business Network um, who are going to be, we're going to be working with them for this trade mission. So Fraser and Ian are going to be our market leads and they're going to be the ones who are organising the business to business meetings. So I'll just let Fraser and Ian um, say a few words. So Fraser, over to you. Thanks so much, Sinan. Um, first of all, it's wonderful to be uh, part of initiatives like this. This is a very positive end to what's been otherwise at times negative year. Um, so this is all very encouraging. So just a very few quick words on the Scottish Business Network. We are the largest uh, global network of Scottish business leaders in the world, over 10,000 um, on our radar. And this year uh, we set up uh, ambassadorial positions in the United States and are in the process of setting up um, our uh, uh, 501c6 trade association entity in New York City. So we've had big events ourselves this year and I think the biggest value that we, we want to bring to people both with the uh, Glasgow Chamber of Commerce and participants is valuable connections and we're making inroads into uh, building our network with 9,000 plus Scottish University alumni in, who are present in industry in New York City. So um, synchronous with what everyone said today about valuable connections, um, that's the number one asset which we hope to bring to Glasgow Chambers of Commerce. So um, I'll hand over to Ian uh, after that. Thank you, Fraser. I would just uh, echo what Fraser has said. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It's wonderful to see so many colleagues and friends on the call and in meeting. Um, yes, inroads into various policy decision makers. We've been very engaged with the trade negotiations as, as well. Uh, so we're here to help. Uh, maybe Fraser and I will just drop our emails into the chat so you can be in touch with us, but not a whole lot more to add to what Fraser has already said. I know I wanna be sensitive to the timetable but hello, everyone. Look forward to working with you and engaging with you and really, truly being a resource to help Glasgow and to help uh, you advance your goals. 